All right, this week on Paul's Security Weekly, but Paul is not here. I'm Doug White, and I will be Paul this week, sort of, somehow. I'm not sure. But we've got for you an interview with, uh, with Major John Alfred, who is retired from the Rhode Island State Police at Computer Crimes. Uh, second up, we've got a discussion with Tom Leonardo and John Alfred about all sorts of stuff. We're going to talk about privacy, GDPR, CFAA, and whatever else we think of uh, in relation to the long arm of the law and all that kind of good stuff. And in the third segment, as always, the security news. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. The need to communicate and collaborate on a global level has created a proliferation of cloud-based tools for businesses. But with new channels come new gaps for hackers and many new security blind spots. You need full threat visibility across channels with a solution that works at the speed your company does. Perception Point's multi-layered platform provides the most robust threat prevention on the market. Perception Point advanced collaboration security designs for the modern enterprise. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash perception point. And tonight, Doctor Who bringing in Paul as Doctor Doug. It is actually Doctor Doug who is Paul tonight on Paul Security Weekly. Take it away, Doctor Doug. All right, thank you. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever got introduced before. I hosted the show one other time, and they were just like, I don't know, some guy we found or something like that. But. Uh, Tonight, uh, welcome to Paul's Security Weekly. This is episode 737, an auspicious number, uh, recorded April 20th, 2022 at Jew Unit Studios in Rhode Island. Uh, we've got uh, in the studio Tom Leonardo, uh, exciting attorney and uh, all around amazing guy. Hi, Tom. Hello. Good to have you here again. Uh, Do I look exciting? No, but uh, okay. we'll, we'll work up to that. All right. So. On the line, we've got the amazing Tyler Robinson. <laughs> Hi, Tyler. I don't know. He looked, he looked pretty excited for, uh, you know, a retired ISP officer in studio at our studio, which, you know, may have things he might just have to plug his ears and close his eyes for. At attorneys in open bars. You know how that goes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of like hackers in open bars. Also on the line, Mr. Josh Marpet. Hi, Josh. Hey, how you doing, Doug? It's a pleasure to be here as always. I'm looking forward to this one tonight. We're going to talk digital forensics. We're going to talk crime. We're going to talk all kinds of fun things. I, I think so, yeah. That, that was my plan, was that we could talk about some cool stuff like that. Uh, our guest in his first segment, that, first, I, I got to read this uh, ad, though. Oh, sorry, I forgot about that. It's, it's always, you know. Uh, Security Weekly listeners, save $100 on your RSA Conference 2022 full conference pass. RSA Conference will be live in San Francisco, June 6th to 9th, 2022. Security Weekly will be there in some context, delivering real-time live coverage and interviewing some of the event's top speakers and sponsors. To register using our discount code, please visit HTTPS securityweekly.com slash RSAC2022 and use the code 52U Cyber. We hope to see you there in San Francisco. Because that, that's always fun, right? I, I mean, does everybody go to RSA? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 went, I spoke once. It was, it was actually nice. Yeah, and I like San Francisco. I used to go there a lot. So You got all, you got all the CISOs and you know, the nice parties that the vendors spend a lot of money on. I'm not sure <laughs> how the conference actually is. But. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all There's right. There's a conference there somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, anywhere would be good now, right? I mean, it's it's like any pick pick a place and we'll we'll go there just to go somewhere. So I have one. I have one in Switzerland this summer, so that's kind of nice. And, uh, you can't go wrong with Switzerland, and they're neutral too, right? So. Man, that sounds fun. Yeah, you might live through the nukes. We'll see. <laughs> Maybe that's that's where I plan to be. Uh, our guest on this first segment is Major John Alfred, is retired Rhode Island State Trooper, and was one of the members of the Computer Crimes Unit origin story. So, but long before there was anybody else, there was John. And I, I mean, I think John's been around in this area since nobody actually knew what digital forensics and, and computer crimes really were. 
Uh, John oversaw the growth of the computer dry crimes unit in Rhode Island, and, and it became like one of the top digital crime units in the country. And it might actually be the first one. I, I, I don't know if anybody had a computer crimes unit. So welcome, John. And we'll, I'll ask you that question in a minute. But uh, welcome aboard to Security Weekly. It's first time. It is. Thanks for having me, Doug. I'm excited. Yeah, well, I'm glad you could come. I know, I know it was really tough for uh, law enforcement people to come on the show. Because <laughs> they have, like, rules about that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, you're going to be a little picky about what you go on, you know. Yeah, it would have made me nervous. As, as he, let's be clear, as he sits about three feet away from the 55-gallon barrel of lube. <laughs> well, there is that, but uh, I, I don't think they have a policy about that. No, but. there's not. There's not. <laughs> that I'm aware of, anyway. Well, well so, I, so I was going to ask you that. So was, was that the first computer crimes unit? So it wasn't the first computer crimes unit. Um, it was, I wouldn't say the first in the country. We, there was some that it was starting to spring up at the time. That was, what, 2007, 2008? Yeah, it was like 2007, I think. Uh, and uh, we started off with uh, one person that grew into two, and then there was four of us all together to begin with, and we constantly had our machines breaking down, and every time we tried to do a forensics on a computer, it was, you know, crashing, and it was interesting. Yeah, because I, I remember, like, in probably 2006, because whenever I lived somewhere, I usually offered, like, state police or local police, you know, like, if you need, uh, not to say you can't do your job, but if you want an expert or something, you know, I, my, my brother was a career police officer, and I know they never had any budget, and they always needed, like, advice on technical stuff. And, and I, it was the first time I ever called anybody, and, and I called Ken Bell. So he was, right. Ken Bell was a sergeant of the Rhode Island State Police. And I called Ken Bell because I knew him from somewhere. I met him at something. I was like, well, if you ever need anybody, he was like, okay, come on over. Right. And I was like, w wait, what? <laughs> I, I, I never had anybody take me up on that before. <laughs> I was like, uh-oh, now we're, we're in trouble. We were looking for pretty much any help we could get. At the but time. I, was, I was like amazed that they even had anything because a lot of play like in Colorado back then, they didn't have anything. You know, it was just like, you know, crazy. But well, how, so, so my, my first question for you then is, is how did you get your start in, in all this? Well, uh, when I was in uniform, I was one of the guys that was the techie guy that knew how to load the printer and those types of mm -hmm. things. <laughs> got into, got into that uh, that detectives. Was that was good. Okay. That's, that's where every high-tech crimes officer yeah. came from back Pretty in much. like 2005. Because I, I would actually went to some departments, and they would say, oh, this is Steve. He's our high-tech crimes officer. You go, really, Steve? Like, what's your, what's your background? You go, I, I don't actually know anything. I, I had a computer that, that was on my desk, and so somebody came in and went, uh, you're the high-tech crimes officer. <laughs> so pretty much how it went. So when, we, when I got into detectives, we didn't have a computer crimes unit. I knew that was something I wanted to do. I was looking forward to doing that, and I kind of uh, knew that that was the future. Um, they, I was in the major crimes unit for a while, and they, they turned around and they said, hey, you interested in going to computer crimes? We had uh, Ken Bell and, and John Killian at the time. Um, and I said, yeah, I'd been very interested in going in. And uh, it was my, ended up uh, also uh, Stacy Shepard, if you remember Stacy. Yeah, yeah. It, it was the four of us. Um, so we, we started up in the upstairs at the Lincoln Barracks and uh, had two com three computers. We shared uh, one and uh, said, let's, let's figure out what we're going to do here. That's... <laughs> I remember. No, I really do, because because yeah. uh, I when I first came over there, they had just talked to URI, and they had uh, uh, Jake was over there, and they yep. were starting to build like some some stuff, and and Ken was like, "We're going to turn this into like this crazy big thing," and, yep. and it was, and you were you were a corporal. I don't even think it was a corporal. Well, you were not I, a I corporal just, yet. I okay, I remember when, when you came over there though, and yeah. I, that's that was that was pretty amazing. I, so when you first started doing that. What was computer crime like? I mean, I mean, I know there was computer crime going on, and some of the people here could tell you all about it, but right. uh, I mean... So if you remember back 2007, 2008, uh, we didn't have a great relationship with uh, the public uh, as far as they didn't want to call the police. And if you think <laughs> back, back then, they thought we were going to come in and take down everything and, and pull everything, all their equipment down and, and, and you know, stop the business. And maybe we would have, I don't know. But... Um, we had to kind of morph it to figure out how we were going to manage or how we were going to investigate the crimes. And a lot of the crimes that were coming in at the time were child exploitation, which they still are, quite honestly. Uh, and we had to manage that, too. So really, we had two different things we were looking at. We were looking at the fraud-type complaints as well as we were looking at the exploitation complaints. Um, and we had to um, figure out, well, we got to do forensics as well. We didn't have a budget for civilians. So uh, the federal government came up with some money to train us in forensics and to go from there to try to start prosecuting people. So, <clears throat> I, I mean, so back then, I mean, child, I guess child pornography was illegal, obviously. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, and so there were actually laws on the books that said this it was. Is, and, and, and did that apply to digital stuff too? I mean, or was it complicated to move um, it from, from that to digital? It fit. 
Um, if it, so if you know, we as police officers a lot of times have to work with very old laws, archaic laws, yeah. from that far back as the 1950s, 40s, or whatever it might be, and make it fit in today's world. Okay. So yes. Yeah, I mean I, that was that was my impression was back then too was was but there were there was a lot of complications with that stuff even then. Of course. Because I remember like being an expert for a judge who was just literally asking me to to he would turn and go what is what is a hard drive you know and and I was having to tell the I was just literally like an aside during this case because the attorney the expert would say something and the judge would turn to me and go what 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 does that mean right. and I would have to try to explain it to him real sure. quick so he had some idea what they were talking about because he had no clue right and yet so, he's hearing this case well, a lot of judges uh, had to analy uh, analogize a computer to hard Component. Yeah, and that was, and I was, I'm actually good at that. Yeah. So I was actually always good at, at trying to, to take stuff and put it into other contexts to try to let file people cabinets and right because you had to do that. They didn't know any technical terms. They didn't know any. They didn't use computers. They uh, some of them didn't allow computers in the courtroom because I got kicked out of a civil case because I had a laptop. <laughs> and the guy was like, "What is that? What is that?" I was like, "It's just my. I'm taking notes for for. I work for the experts." And he was like, "Yeah, you're out. Black out. magic." No, he was like, out. I, I don't allow any I actually, of that crap. In the early parts of my career, I taught uh, a couple of classes on seniors, for senior citizens to teach them how to use computers. And I swear to God, the explanations I came up with to explain the different pieces. This is not the hard drive. This is a CPU. And this is, you know, and the difference between the RAM and the hard drive. This is the desktop. This is the file cabinet. I used the exact same explanations in court as an expert witness. And it was amazing how all of a sudden everybody's eyes went, oh, okay, now I yeah. get it. Thank you. Sure. Well, so so one of my I had sort of thought about a question to ask you to try to help us like a lot of people out there to sort of see how this evolved. So my my example was so if if say a school call called the 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 state police in 2000 2010 and today and said we're being hacked. T t could, could you just tell me like what would the responses be like in those different and I I, I know I could say but I I want, I want you to tell me what what well, you think. I think I mean so from now, you know, today, back to 2010, well, I'd say back to 2007, it's a completely different response. Absolutely. We actually have trained police officers now. We got, so the biggest, the biggest difference for us or across the country is that the federal government recognized that local and state police departments needed uh, training and they needed uh, money and we didn't have the money. So we were lucky enough to uh, get grant money. In fact, I think you were instrumental yeah. in helping us uh, write those grants. Uh, to actually get the, the police officers trained. So I would say that back then, we would have said, well, let's see what we can do for you. And we'd call them in and we'd probably work with Nespin, uh, which is the uh, New England uh, State Police. And, and the, 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 we'd work with them to get more people and to get uh, them some help. Now we've got people on site that can show up and understand and can talk the talk and walk the walk. So like if I call right now and I say somebody's breaking into my stuff, yeah. there's somebody there that, that I don't, they're not going to go. Because what did they say in 2000? <laughs> well, you better call, you better call <laughs> the luck. FBI, right? <laughs> DEA, yeah. somebody. Yeah, somebody, somebody other than us, I guess, and, right? But uh, And I know what the FBI said in 2000. <laughs> you better call somebody else besides Yeah, they were us. like, call the state police. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Back and forth, sure. I, at least uh, the ones we refer to the FBI back in like the late 90s and early 2000s, I had a couple of clients that called me and they were being hacked. And one of them had, had significant financial harm that was being done to their company. And we contact the FBI and the question of the, the FBI was, is it more than $5,000? Right. And, and our answer was, well, I don't know, maybe. If yeah. I say yes, will you come? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, but you're gonna maybe. have to show that. Yeah. And you know, the, the, I was like, so is it more than 5,000? And the company owner was like, no, but it was like our, our monthly income you right. know, got taken. Right. And, well, that and takes it up to a felony if it's over five. So they don't, they don't oh, is that what it is? Yeah, yeah the CFAA has a $5,000. Now the oh, number is much, know. much higher than $5,000. Well, yeah, you probably get more to. calls than that. But I mean, I got so many calls back in the late 90s, early 2000s from citizens who said they call the police. Right. And, and even, I mean, a lot of times the police didn't have an option, right? I mean, even today, there's a lot of stuff you're not going to be able to do anything about. Right. Because, like, I remember a case that I got. This woman called me and said, is there anything? I want you to come help me. She'd lost, like, I don't know, like $21,000 or something like that. She was trying to buy exercise equipment. And she sent, I mean, you know, and you know this stuff. Yeah, she yeah, sent yeah. the money, you know, yeah. in advance because the guy wouldn't send the stuff. And, you know, and, oh, and, of, and of course, guess what? She never got her exercise equipment. But right. You know, as nearly as we could tell, the guy was located in a foreign country. Which, 
again, so that, and that's a problem too. You have boundaries that you have to be concerned with. And a lot of the, the cases that we got or have been getting, as you, I'm just no 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 real uh, mystery about this is they're out of the country. Well, yeah, I mean a ransomware the attack that comes in today, if, even if it's in Rhode Island. I mean, you're, and your your jurisdiction ended at at the border of Rhode Island, right? right? I mean, that's so correct. so you can't even go to right. Connecticut. No, we can't, but we do. So we started a task force. So we have a federal agents on with us as well. So that if we have to go to Connecticut or we have to go to Massachusetts or you know Iowa, whatever it might be, we we can do that now. Yeah, I wanted to talk so about that a little bit. Even I mean, I, I I'm not I want you. I'm not asking you specifics because I know that's not a good idea. But but I mean, I remember when I first was dealing with some of this, and I would talk to people in law enforcement, and they didn't talk to each other, mm. let alone to me or to anybody in the industry, mm. and. I, I, the, so the task force and the fusion centers and all that kind of stuff kind of grew up out of nine one nine eleven, right? That's correct. That yep. was, and t tell us a little bit about what those things are, just from a general perspective. So after nine eleven, uh, we as a country, as law enforcement, we recognized that we didn't talk to each other uh, enough or well enough, or inform one another, or shared information. So that's where the onus of the of the, of the, the born of the fusion center. That's where it came from. It was it was we needed to share better information. So we have. Uh, I think there's 58 or 59 different fusion centers across the country right now <clears throat> that their job is to gather intel and share intel across the country. So that that needed to be done. Now, as far as not talking to one another, I think we do a much better job federally and state and local than we ever did. Uh, and like, like I said, our task force here in Rhode Island, we have local state police and uh, federal agents that are working all together. Day, day in and day out, whether that be for exploitation cases or be some type of a hacking situation or uh, even uh, that's that's for public com uh, countries, uh, uh, companies or for a, a, a you know, government. And er well. does every state have one of those kind of they things? They do not. So 2012, I guess it was, 2013, we started the Joint Cyber Task Force, which um, you're, again, mm -hmm. part of that as well. And uh, we were actually the first one for that in the country, which was a public... Um, a private-public partnership that worked to p help local agencies or local uh, businesses that were hit by some type of uh, a ransomware or something along that line. But like I said uh, from the get-go, from way back when, people didn't want to talk about hacks. Mm -hmm. So 2007, 2008, if Citizens Bank or one of the bigger companies got hit, nobody talked about it, and mm -hmm. they, they kind of pushed it to the back, cleaned the machines, and moved on, right? Um, then I think people started to recognize that, hey, I'm not alone. There's a lot of people that are getting hit at this point. Maybe we should be sharing this with law enforcement. Maybe we should make sure that other people are not getting hit. And I think that whole, uh, it, it's, uh, what would I call it, opinion or thoughts of not sharing has gone a little bit more by the wayside. I mean, there is still some of it, but not nearly as much as it was my I mean, first there's some of that in the industry, too. I mean, I mean, if you work for a company that company typically doesn't want you to talk about stuff that's happened right. to you. Right. And when we first started having those meetings about the Joint Cyber Task Force, and me and you and Ken, mm -hmm. and we were talking about how to try to get citizens that were that were tech people. Right. Because Rhode Island got tons of tech people. Tons. And I was like, some of these people are really, really good at what they do. They yeah. have lots of knowledge. It was like, wouldn't it be great if we could bring them in or make them available or we just knew who their names were so we could call them up and ask questions? Well, or what the same reason we wanted to pick your brain. We need people like that. I mean, that's their full-time job. We're mm -hmm. doing a million other different hats, you know, but uh, that's what you do. So we need people like you to help us along and figure out and, and I to go. and I yeah and I think that that has helped because one of the early things that I, I've heard you say and I saw it was that people were afraid to call the police yeah. I mean I mean I would have been I mean if you come to me in, in you know 1992 or something and said you know should we call the police and I mean I've been there I've been in companies where they were saying should we call the police it's like oh hell no right right like right. under no circumstances right. are we going to have them come in here because they're going to swoop right. down and and yep. you know they're going to take all our computers and, and, and shut that, us down that might have been 92 that's probably the way it yeah. was I, I well I saw, I saw forensics, it absolutely yeah, yeah. Yep. Dead, dead box, box forensics, forensics. Yep. they come in they take either the, you know the entire computer it, yank the plug out of the wall or out of the computer take the computer with them image it using a write blocker put the computer into a vault where it would never be seen again <laughs> yeah. and then, you know, carve the image. Well, yeah, I was, was I was helping a company in another state that got into that very thing. They, they had called the police because they got a fraud that was done through the, it wasn't even really a hack. It was more like a regular old fraud kind of case. 
And the, the police came and took all their stuff. Yeah, yeah, and the yeah. guy was like, can you help us get back up and running? They came in here and they just took everything. And they put it in a van and drove away with it. And we don't even know where it is. And it was like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of stuff. And we don't know what they've done with it or if it's right. being protected or what. Well, so I think the biggest thing that came out of the task force or the, the uh, joint type cyber task force is that <clears throat> you had someone to call. So they knew when they called they were going to speak to me. They knew who I was. So the companies that were on board with us, they'd say, hey, Call John, and, and they'll take care of it. They're not going to come in and pull the plug, you know. Uh, they're going to come in and help you out in any way they can. So and that, it was making relationships, and that, that's so important. I, th I think it's important in your world, too, still today, uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the cyber world, that you have to talk to one another. Right? Well, I mean, that was – I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's the culture of computer forensic professionals to collaborate for the most part. I mean, they, they take pride in what they do. They like to show their expertise. So they're, they're always yeah. usually willing to jump in when they can. I think it's kind of a close culture and specialization. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> okay. Josh, Josh is going to agree with that. Well, I think, I, I, think mean, for, I, I agree and I disagree. And okay. the reason that I agree is that we all like to talk to each other because we like to say, hey, did you see this? This is really neat. Let me show you what I did, blah, blah, blah. The problem is, is that we're under NDA to our clients, to our corporate masters, to whomever. And so the, you know, the, the legal teams are like, wait, talk to somebody. Oh my God, yeah. no. You know, and it's and and then it's of course the fact that if you report it to the FBI uh, and you're like, okay, so I reported a crime that happened, and can you tell me what happened? And like, uh, no, that never happened. No, no, here's my here's my email where I reported it to you. They're like, can I have that? Thank you. It never happened. It's a black hole. Well, still today, so, you know, I agree. I agree with both of you though because. I will, I will, I'm, I'm 100% with Josh because I've definitely been there. And, you know, and that was one of my early awakening kind of things was like, you know, maybe we should call somebody and corporate legal was like, oh no, uh uh, under no circumstances is this ever to be discussed ever again. Well, that's but, why they pass laws where you have to report out now. Right. right. Well, and, and so that was kind of one of the basic ideas that we talked about with the Joint Cyber Task Force was trust. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, that there because I had always seen this in the industry so I remember uh, a case uh, it wasn't a like a crime case or anything like that but a situation and I was not allowed to you know do any kind of formal thing on this but I knew somebody and I knew this person at Cisco and I was able to call that person as you know a friendly call like, hey, you know, can I just ask you a couple of questions? And that was completely different than if I had to go through some kind of formal channel, which was going to be a violation of all that's holy. And that was the idea was that if people knew John because they went to a meeting or they knew him from there, they would feel a lot more comfortable calling John and saying, I can ask John a question without turning this into a whole big jackpot. Happened all the time. It's yeah. a great thing. It was. It was a, I, I mean, it, it wasn't my idea, but I, but I thought it was a really smart thing because in that context, people could reach out all the time. And we were even talking about trying to set up anonymous kind of mm -hmm. ways for law enforcement officers to ask questions because I did want to, I was going to ask you just because I had a chance to, um, a lot of law enforcement officers are real nervous around tech. Would, would you agree with that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because I used to teach, when I used to teach forensics to, and, I, and when I first started teaching forensics, it was all police. Mm -hmm. There was nobody in the room except police. And I could always tell they're getting nervous because they start putting their hands on their guns. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, people had you know, ankle holsters. Yeah, 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 and, you know, yeah. they, were all, they were all in like plain clothes. But, I mean, you know, they're all, you could just tell they're getting really you, nervous you about You think that's them. the reason or they were just pissed off of the way you were teaching? Oh. I'm not going there. <laughs> 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 but, but I do when agree they, with Josh. I, I do think that, that there was a lot of, and there's still today, a lot of sort of closed doors around. Because, I mean, what's the answer from corporate legal every time? No. I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of people who are not tied directly to corporate, but the people who do it for a living that are more into the networking uh, or the network of networking, so yeah. to speak. Not so and, much. And I do, I do completely agree with that because I know if I had a real serious problem like that, I'm, I could call some of the people on the show. And I mean, if I call Tyler or I say, I jump on Slack and ask Tyler, I know Tyler will give me an answer and he's not going to disclose that. You can that. give a hypothetical and he can give you an answer yeah. on, on how to approach this. But, but in the networking world and the technology world, it's a lot like police because police officers are always uncomfortable talking to civilians because they don't know what they're going to do. You know, you come and talk to me about a case, and I go, oh, I'm going to go talk to the, to the Providence Journal about that case because yeah. they'll put me a headline up with my name on it, and they didn't like to talk to, uh, to outsiders at, in that same way. I mean, wouldn't you think, wouldn't you agree? Uh, absolutely agree. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, you got you got to pick your friends and make sure you know who they are before you're talking. But to them. but that's that right. was why we thought if everybody knew each other, then that back channel right. kind of stuff that was going on with the tech people. Because I wouldn't I wouldn't hesitate a second to call Josh or or Tyler about a, a question. Because I know that they're not going to go running off to, to CNN and say, I want to get on TV, and I can well, do that I, if I talk I about I think this. we had many opportunities where I called you said, hey, Doug, what do you think of this? Yeah. And you said, I'll get back to you. And well, that's probably and, where it went. And once you know those people, you kind of know, yeah, you know which people you can yeah, talk yeah. to. And, but and, be honest, the problem is that he never got back to you. <laughs> <laughs> I was drunk. Come on. <laughs> no, he was pretty good about getting back to you. Usually, usually. Usually. I'm yeah. actually, I mean, I've got that kind of thing with several police forces of governments and actually my local radio station weirdly enough they use me and uh, used to be my local tv station would use me for you know hey this latest cybersecurity case came up what do you think and i'd give them blurb and talk them through as you as you grow in stature in the community you know in, in the law enforcement or in the infosec community you get people calling you and going hey what's going on and uh whether it's law enforcement uh cybersecurity or whatever it's useful to have the connections to go find out if it's something i don't know about i'll be like hey you want to talk to tyler you want to talk to doug you want to talk to paul whatever and it, it helps a lot i i, I will but, tell you one of the really cool phone calls i got one time was from a person who was in one of my classes i don't even remember which class it was somewhere in somewhere in the world i but the person was a police officer like a like a city police like a uniform yep. you know kind of person the person called me on a cell phone and said I just need to ask you something and and you can't tell anybody and and I, I i need it to be a completely closed you know and i was like sure whatever and and he was like i'm going to show you something and i need you to tell me if you have any idea what it is and and he it, this was this was more uh, recent enough that he could do it with a phone and he sent me a picture of it and he was like we're in a situation where we think this is a bomb and i was like <laughs> Don't don't say anything snarky. Don't say anything snarky. <laughs> you, know, my, you know me. How many places we go? Run like hell. You know, <laughs> but you know, I, I was looking at it and I was like, yeah, that that's an Xbox. You know, but but in the context of it, I it was scary. Mm. I mean, this picture was a room full of explosives, and this kid was, uh, mm. you know, I mean, I mean, this kid's been collecting all kinds of explosive stuff, and he's got an Xbox set in the middle of it, and right. you know, so it was a reasonable question. But the fact that that person could call somebody and get that kind of response without, you know, activating the national guard, sure. I think really facilitated that kind of case. But that's also a very dangerous game for police officers to play, right? Um, of course it is. I mean, it's in any any business or, or public, again, private. Uh, you have to be. You have, to, you have to talk to trustworthy people. You just can't, specifically law enforcement, you can't be releasing information because everybody's all over the internet now and mm -hmm. you know, Twitter's a, a million miles a minute. So you got to make sure that you're knowing who you're speaking to and make sure that you can trust them. Did you, ha did you have something, Tyler? Yeah, I was just curious. Some of the, what are some of the ways that you are seeing today for people to get engaged and kind of get over some of the hurdles of interacting with law enforcement, contributing. Uh, what are some meaningful ways to do that? There's a lot of, you know, between trafficking cases, exploitation cases, things that you're seeing on the internet. Where are good places to interact? And what are some of the caveats to dealing with law enforcement and, and kind of getting integrated into some of those uh, teams and, and situations that you do have connections? So, like I spoke about the Joint Cyber Task Force, we have a meeting, well, we were having a meeting once a month uh, before COVID. Uh, where we get together and we discuss the latest and greatest of what's going on for s cyber threats. But the, those cyber threats could also include, you know, trafficking online, uh, which we had a real problem with here in Rhode Island a while back as well, uh, uh, and some of the, the back page and those types of things. Um, it could also be, uh, you know, a, a, a child pornography case. It could, it, there's, there's several different things. It could be anything. It could be anything to do with a, a crime. Um, We've had uh, we've 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 received so many good tips that way, where someone will find out. Well, Rhode Island being a small place, people find out. Well, I know this guy, I know that guy. Oh, well, I know John. I'll, I'll give him a call. Or I know Ken. Or you know, now uh, I know Eric, who's who's in charge of the the unit, and they can give the information. There's also tip lines out there. Uh, the state police has a tip line on our website, as well. Um, so there's, there's many ways that you can get to us, and uh, it can be anonymous as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be Josh called us and told us this. Damn it. He said it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where your, your, uh, 
your screen drops down while you're you're testifying against the mafia, right, Josh? It's, I, 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 I cannot confirm or deny that I've ever been in such a situation. <laughs> well, yeah, I had, I had a case uh, a couple of years ago where I, ca I called you about uh, somebody, somebody approached me and said, I, I know something's going on. Yep. And, and, and I called you and I said, can this person call you and talk to you? Yep. And, and you guys did and turned into a, a real case and, yep. and it was a big deal. And, uh, and I, I just saw some headlines about that recently. So good. Uh, good. Yeah. That's what we like. Yeah, I mean, it, it was. I mean, I, th I, th I think, and I think people can get involved in that kind of stuff now. I think there's more, at least, a little more openness about that with the fusion centers and things like that. Because I know just just the fact that you can subscribe to the fusion center and MSI sec means you can get information from them, even if if you're not giving it to them directly. You can not necessarily as an individual, but as a business, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, I mean, yep. a, a businesses can, but I mean, individuals can subscribe to some of those, not the fusion center, but to MSI sec and some of these other yes, they, uh, outlets. Right. And, and there's a lot of those kind of opportunities. And uh, yep, there is. FBI sure. has some stuff too, right? They do. They they have um, they have a couple of different things that very similar to what we we created. Yes. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yes. I was a member of one of those things. Yeah, so, in yeah. Rhode Island, they had one in Rhode Island. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We went to New Hampshire. Right? I was around the one in Mass too, so it was yeah. like that. Yep. You know, it's interesting. You've got a lot of more coordination between the local and regional law enforcement and national law enforcement and the civilian commercial organizations. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll throw a few of them out there. Besides the fusion centers, you've got the RCFLs, which are the regional cyber forensic labs. Uh, I think I got that acronym right. Yeah, you've you got the, um, thank you, because <laughs> I always screw it up. You've got InfraGuard from the FBI. That's the public-private partnership yeah. uh, from the FBI. You've got uh, the ECTF, the Electronic Crimes Task Force. That's the Secret Service, right. who is no way in an absolutely no way, shape, or form competing with the FBI at all and ever. I mean, let's be honest, right? Um, you've got uh, significant amounts of uh, just just meetings. And in general, you know, I, I, it, it's so much easier in the last, I don't know, 10 years to go sit down with an FBI agent or a, a law enforcement uh, officer and say, hey, there's something weird going on, let's talk, uh, so, than it was in no, the 90s and early 2000s. Josh, another one, IC3.gov. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we forgot report, about that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, you can report yeah. as well. Uh, any, you know, do you, you get a lot of referrals uh, from the IC3? We do. Yeah. We do get a, a ton. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, move, if, if, does anybody have anything else about that? No, I, I mean, I, I think huge amount of progress have been made on that from what I can see. And, and at least, at least locally, the other, the other area that I would mention is, is uh, emergency management. Uh, you know, I, I, we saw that evolve too. So yep. when I, when I first got involved in that, you know, it was like the EMA people had no clue. Uh, I remember FEMA came up here and, and I ended up talking to them for like six hours cause they were asking questions about cyber events. Yep. And that wasn't even in their, you know, their bailiwick. And in fact, the Rhode Island Computer Crimes Unit was the ones that first started pushing that that desk at, at Rima into right. that model of when they had events and, and having cyber somebody from computer crimes, you know, at least available when they're activated and yep. all that kind of stuff. And I and I thought that was a real move forward too, from what I saw. And they've in since put a cyber analyst within Rima. Uh, well, so absolutely, so because, you know, I, I, when we first started talking to them, you know, I don't think they really grasped, you know, they were no. still, th it was, it was being run by retired police, retired firefighters right. and people like that. And they just really weren't on that page and they, they wanted to be, and right. they, they real quickly embraced that because they, they saw the importance of, of cyber and how you could actually have a cyber event that could cause a total, total chaos right. that didn't involve a fire or a, or a hurricane or anything like that. And, and that was interesting to watch that evolve. I, it was very cool to, to see how that well, developed. I think it took the federal government a little while to realize it, too. Yeah. They, they certainly do now. I mean, with, you look at what we, what's happened the last few years. But uh, back then, uh, it was a, eh, it probably won't happen. But now we know it's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. And, and people started writing. I mean, I wrote some scenarios. Other people wrote scenarios that they were doing for training exercise. And I think that helped convince them. Because, just because it was plausible, right? You know, just the idea that oh, uh oh, this right. could be bad if all these websites go down. Then they started thinking about critical infrastructure and, and mm -hmm. you know the. Well, even today, I mean, that. if you go to the police, like they want you to go, you just said you know, tip lines on a website, right? And and a lot of other stuffs on the website too, especially during the pandemic. There was sure. a lot of this, you know, it was yep. all it was supported in website. If that stuff goes down, people are going to freak out, and, yep. and you're going to have generations of people who have never had any other model. They don't know you could go to a payphone and, you know. It's always been my biggest oh, fear. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Can I tell my favorite story about this? Uh-oh. 
there was a group of kids that got that decided to do like urban exploring stuff. You know, they're they're go, oh look, we're gonna go travel through a sewer or whatever. They get trapped in the sewer. They're safe, they're okay, <laughs> but they're trapped. So the one girl takes out her cell phone and says, I've got I've got signal. Well, fantastic. She goes on Facebook, puts out an update, help, help, help. We're trapped in the sewer. Here's who who we are, here's where we are, closes her phone and puts it back in her pocket. Doesn't think or know how to call 911. <laughs> so Facebook became 911. I think it could be. I mean, I mean, a lot of police agencies monitor, you know, social media and have a yeah. social media site so you can post on the social media Might site. Might be a little quicker with 911, though, I'm thinking. If you quicker. know how to do that. 911's a toughie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you got to remember three numbers. And <laughs> That's a lot. If you, if you can't dial it automatically, a voice dial or something. <laughs> John, how do you discern oh. discern the good oh, tips from the uh, bad tips? We got rated tips. on uh, Twitch. We got Twitch rated from uh, Gary Gar Seven Gar Seven Gar Seven. Sorry, Gar I'm not Gar Gar Cool. Sorry, just uh, we we got. There's a Twitch feed going on in the that. background oh, too, okay. so that they're monitoring. I, I'm not good enough at multitasking to do all that. If I was really snarky, like one of those YouTuber people, I could be doing Twitch, Discord, and and also doing the show and. And being funny all at the same time. So as you it is, I can't do any ADD of those. To do it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let a youngster J uh, Josh handle that side of the world. You you know how to talk to those kids with your emoticons and all that stuff. Uh, youngster, Christ, I never mind. Just you kids keep on today, moving, Dad. <laughs> and your AOL. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, you kids! You, you got, got mail. mail. I'm I'm curious, kind of what. <laughs> what your stance was before you left and kind of what your stance is now moving into kind of the retired private sector around uh, some of the encryption wars and, and the back doors being built in for law enforcement and some of the, you know, the things that we all yell about. When you say we mean, who's we? I would say the <laughs> privacy advocates, information or cybersecurity community in general. Yeah. Um, I would say anybody that understands encryption or has seen it go wrong typically tends to side uh, on the air of caution and, and why those things are bad. So you feel that encryption encryption is a good thing so that law enforcement can't get into things? Is that what you're saying to me or what are you saying? Well, I, I am asking what your opinion is around that. Like, <laughs> obviously, there there is a lot of... There's a lot of things that adds complexity and issues for... Uh, law enforcement uh, and bad guys, but I am curious, kind of your thoughts, unabated by my opinion first, and then then we then we should chat. Okay, so uh, so now that I'm on the outside, I'm no longer with the state police. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, uh, it hasn't changed. Um, I still believe that um, I know in my heart of hearts, I was never ever going to try to look at somebody's information unless it was going to save someone or help someone or you know maybe prosecute a person that needed to be prosecuted for, you know, taking up a family of six or whatever it might be. <clears throat> and uh, I can trust that every one of the officers I work with, and I say this with my whole heart, felt the same way. So I would never use it or overuse it or use anything that was um, beyond what I should be doing other than to make sure that a person got prosecuted or someone was safe. And that, that's, not, that's not a canned response. That's, that's John I'll, I'll, response. I'll, att I'll attest for, for, his, for his people. I, I, I can't speak for anybody else. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I, I worked a lot with, with John and, and his crew and all the people over yeah. there. And, and I, I, they, they really, yeah, I, I, would, I would attest for them. But, but I, I do no, think I, that that can be abused. Of course it can. I 100% I I believe in that. And I, I think you're very genuine. And in all the law enforcement that I've ever worked with, the mission is always first priority. People's safety is always first priority, and is always very. It's it's a deep conviction for all of them. Now, that's kind of the the take that I was expecting to hear from you. For one, which is great. I don't disagree with you at all in that in that manner. What I was kind of alluding to was the uh, the missing part of of why I think the disconnect between what you guys are saying, what you need, and what most of the infosec community and um, I would say the the population of, of IT people that kind of understand the encryption side of that, I think the disconnect there is one we don't feel that law enforcement will abuse it, but the 
reality is attackers will find a way into those systems if those backdoors are built, and there's always a way to abuse that. And it's typically not by law enforcement. So I think there's a disconnect there, and I was curious to see if that kind of rang true through you and if that had changed when you got out versus what you were doing now. No, I think it's it's stayed the same, and I understand what you're saying. Yes, obviously, uh, with every good thing, a bad thing could happen, right? Specifically with with digital, um, I will say that yeah, those back doors uh, have we had a lot of success. Specifically, let's say for mobile uh, forensics, for example, getting back doors from the the companies. No, I absolutely haven't. Uh, okay, fine. So we got to figure out other ways to do it, and we have. Um, we're not giving that to you know Joe bag of donuts uh bad guy but uh we're gonna we're gonna figure it out if we can to again for, for safe and life and safety yeah and i think that is that's a, a good clarification for a lot of other people too like the, there's always going to be a way around this like you look at celebrate you look at nso group you look at any of the pegasus stuff like there these systems are always going to be abused there's always going to be someone that figures a way around that and so I've actually went back and forth a little bit, even with my very strong opinion against building those back doors in, because like you said, someone's going to build it, someone's going to have it, and they're going to use it. How easy it is to obtain that for, say, local law enforcement, some of those kits are you know $100,000 just to get into them. So are we actually providing a better ecosystem by not having that that built in you know have the secure from the the vendor and and continuous security that closes all those holes that these companies utilize and then make a profit off of or is it better to find a way to do this different and that's a question that i've battled with and, and still not kind of come up with a solid internal answer because i really am against anybody having the ability to do that without a whole lot of effort but again that also limits and hamstrings and causes me as a taxpayer to have to pay a lot more money for law enforcement to do their job and they're going to do that anyway so right well you know you, actually if, go ahead i'm sorry go ahead and then i'm gonna, pe- I was gonna pe- say so on it. Josh, uh, he mentioned uh, i'm sorry his first name was tyler 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 tyler, tyler had mentioned uh that uh, you know they, they they find ways and they make money off of what they're 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 creating well a lot of these guys that are that have created these businesses worked for you know apple they 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 know they know the background probably guys like you that that know how to you know maneuver around things that most people don't know so yeah they know they can make money off it and they're going to make money off it and yeah they're going to charge us and they do charge us a ton of money uh which if we didn't have federal grant money we could never afford so the whole state would be would be naked um but yeah so they're making money off of it's people in your world that are making money off of the off the public uh, p- partnership well, I, I want to I want to actually push back slightly on that. And you're right. Don't get me wrong. I agree with you. End case ain't cheap. You know, I know that. Okay. Mm-hmm. But uh, when you get to things like, uh, and and I think Tyler, you mentioned Pegasus, right? Um, when you get to Pegasus NSO, there's people in our world, in the information security world, that publicly decry them. Not only won't do business with them, but will not do business with anybody that's ever worked for them. Okay. Because it's not just that, uh, like Encase, for example, fairly ethical organization. If they can break your phone, they're going to break your phone to get at the stuff in it. That's fine. That's acceptable. It's what we do, you know. But uh, Pegasus will actually slip malware onto the phone through a text message, through a, a backdoor of some sort, whatever, and then use that to siphon the information out. That goes beyond the pale. That goes over that line, if you will. Okay. And, um, you know, uh, I think that that goes over the line so far that it is to us it's dirty okay well, i would agree with that and i i'm really curious what you think about that i would agree with that uh i would never send something or send someone a message uh with malware uh to get onto their phone or to find out where they are i, I just wouldn't do it uh, i i know of programs that can do that um we've talked about them uh, maybe tested them out a couple of times but i wouldn't do it <clears throat> so i would say that does go over the line would, would that even be legal i'll ask tom would that well, even be actually, legal actually there are two ki- there are some there was a string of cases called the playpen cases child porn cases where the fbi actually did that they attached the malware uh to a tour program and and, and they actually tra- traced the or origins of these people who were participating in this quote playpen uh encrypted child pornography ring uh and um, they 
got a lot of bad actors through that. And they so actually, is that, so that's like undercover. Kind yeah, of, it's, yeah, it's yeah. like maybe something like the hackback type of thing. It's it's not really a hackback, but it's really attaching a malware so they can actually track. Uh, who's actually participating in this ring? This, this. Uh, no, I mean it, ma- it makes sense. I, I, it's just one of those things I got to kind of think through because it's like, well, you know, when, when I hear the term, I'm going to send you malware, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm going to use that to get into your stuff. That sounds like something that shouldn't be allowed. But then when you put it that way, it, it sounds like yeah, that that seems reasonable enough. I mean, I mean, I'm, somebody's taking the bait. So exactly what happened? Yeah. 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 Well, that, that, so they, that was an exchange of images too. Um, so well, that's, yeah, that, that, that's how they, they did that, the, the play and they found the yeah. server that way. That's what they did to find okay. the server. And they, com- and they uh, uh, basically took over the server for a period of like two or three weeks, and they rounded up these people. Yeah. Makes we, sense. we had a lot of leads from that one. <laughs> I would think so, <laughs> yeah. 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 I would say if we're not if we're not able to play that pointy end of the spear, though, Doug, like especially in, in the digital age and with some of the skill sets and abilities we have, I think we really have hamstrung ourselves and and sometimes, you know, as you guys know, in in war, like there are certain things that require a very pointy end. And I think those lines should be very careful for setting precedents because it can hamstring a lot of people doing a lot of really good things. You look at some of the the articles this week and they finally they finally played out some of the uh, the stuff that was being uh, done for one of the, the largest child porn rings like. There were some big cases taken down, and some of that really does require – I mean, it requires standard detective work, uh, a lot of law enforcement, a lot of communication, a lot of interoperability. But there are technical things that you hamstring some of us that have the ability to do that, and I think that really uh, takes – gives the advantage to the adversary and we really have to be careful how how much precedence gets set as it has been lately, and it makes uh, you know some of us that help a lot – very nervous. So I think those are things that have to be weighed out and often may not be considered by the people making those decisions. Yeah. <laughs> that, I, mean, that, I mean, that's, I mean, that's very complicated stuff. Uh, I mean, there's a lot yeah, of when you subtlety. go scorched earth, it's very, you, you and gotta, it, it sounds, some of it sounds pretty simple to me, but then the more you think about it, there's a lot of complexity and all this stuff too. And how far can you take that? And, 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 you know, backdoors built into encrypted, uh, encryption algorithms and things like that's that clipper chip problem from a long time ago. If, if people don't trust it, they won't use it and, and it eventually will get out and, and probably somebody will abuse it. So I, I think it's a big issue and it's, it's definitely a change in police work. Because it is, and it's, and it's to a means, right? I mean, so you, it, it, Tyler's right. You got to be careful with that. It's 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 it's, it's a fine line. It, it really mm-hmm. is a very fine and line. And I mean, and yeah, and yeah, you have to be care- anytime you're going to be pragmatic, you have to be careful, right? Yeah. Because you, well, you're... that's why we have rules of engagement, and the rules of engagement are different different in a, a, a regional law enforcement investigation, uh, a, a national or federal investigation, a, a military or war situation, a nation state situation. These all have different rules of engagement. And those rules of engagement dictate how we do things, what tools we're allowed to use to do those things, and how we can handle the data once it's received or, or how to deal with it, rather. And do, I do think, think, I mean, sorry. Do you ahead. think those rules of engagement should be more clearly outlined or should they remain vague and should they apply to every group or individual groups or even individuals? I don't think you can have a bright line rule. I think it has to be a balancing of... of goals versus how you want to achieve those goals and under the circumstances it's going to change and dynamically i think it's situational yeah it is situational which means that it, that vague is better vague is better <laughs> i mean right. I, I agree I, with that i, I mean i i, I th- there's this logical part of my brain that wants to say it ought to be laid out it ought to say this 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 and this and not that i mean it ought to be you know and, and i always talk about john mellon who john mellon if you don't know who he was he was a very he was sort of the great grandfather of digital forensics i mean he was a uh, new jersey police officer and he was a customs agent and he started the whole thing about you know uh, forensic certifications and all this stuff and john was everything was black and white with john it was very straightforward <laughs> and he did not like Mr. it Jeff coming out yeah he did <laughs> not Mr. like my, my wife's the same way you know and i we were doing our taxes the other day and, and my wife is an accountant she's a cpa They're there is no gray area. <laughs> you know, to me, everything's a gray area on that. But no, 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 not my wife. I mean, it was like, nope, no, no, absolutely not. No, 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 no. And I'm like, wait, but but this is kind of like, no, it's not. It's very clearly laid out in the IRS guidelines. Let me pull, and she pulls the big book out. Yeah. I was, let me show you on page 9,407 right there. It says you cannot deduct that. And I'm like, but it's kind of a gray. 
taxes are kind of like your hair. Like we really should be careful if we're if we're just gonna say it's black or white. Like there's you know it's speculative. Yeah, and and I think that's true for if you say that to your wife, you're a dead man. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) She's used to it. I turn in my return, she audits me, and then we don't get busted. So you know. She just basically my rejects everything I send My father-in-law is a CPA and a tax guy, and uh, he has a saying. He said, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I just I want agree. to be a pig, I, but I'm not, I, I can't even be a pig. I, you know. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think it's a good idea. I had a, another question about some of this, which was uh, I, maybe a little bit about digital forensics and how that's evolved. Mm-hmm. Because the first forensics case I did, I, I, was, I said and thought about it, and I always tell a story, but it was in 1987, I think. And a city police officer called me and had a missing persons case. Uh, there was some blood. There was a broken window in a car and said, I need you to come look at something. And I was like, oh, I'm going to the morgue. I'm going to get to go to the morgue. This is going to be so cool. <laughs> you know, it's going to be like one of those, you know. And no, the guy, when I go over there, I went to the police station, not the morgue. So it wasn't interesting. And they pull out uh, a five and a quarter inch floppy disk. Yep. And showed it to me, and they said, "What the hell is this?" Oh my God, <laughs> it's a coaster. <laughs> yeah, he was like, "Do you know what this is?" Somebody said it looked like some kind of computer thing, and I was like, "Yeah, it's a computer disk." And he was like, "Can you do something with it?" And I was like, "Maybe." And and Did I they went pull and it analyzed off the refrigerator it. magnet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I took it home and I actually sat down and analyzed it. I had no idea what I was doing. I had absolutely no training, and they didn't either. They didn't, you know, they didn't know what this was. And 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 turned out we actually pulled some actual evidence off of it that it wasn't a missing person case. It was fraud, yeah. and there was some stuff on the floppy disk that belonged to the person who supposedly was missing, where they had written these letters telling the mother that they needed to give them some money. And did I mean how's that evolved since since say like you know when you first got involved in this stuff? Well, I probably haven't seen a floppy disk since probably <laughs> two thousand seven, two thousand six, maybe. Well, that's pretty good <laughs> if you saw one then. <laughs> yeah, they were still around then. We 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 seized a bunch of a lot of uh, child porn guys used to save uh, images, yeah. of them, but not not a lot of images, but enough, right? Um, so what's what's really happened? And I'm I'm still teaching digital forensics over at uh, Salve Regina. Sorry. Uh, Doc, but <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, what's really happened is everything's moved mobile, obviously, and we saw that coming. We knew that was coming. So most of the cases that we do now are all mobile forensics, uh, with the celebrates and, and you know uh, those types of uh, cases, because uh, we're still taking desktops or laptops and whatnot, and maybe we'll look at that. But usually, most of the bulk of the evidence is going to be on a, uh, a a mobile phone or an iPad or something along those lines. Yes. I mean, I mean, is there even a? I'm sorry, is there even a case now that doesn't have some aspect of digital forensics? No, I mean, I, I mean, I don't care if whether it's it's a it's an abuse case or it's a speeding ticket. There's probably some aspect something, of whether it be a video or you know from a phone or from uh, a, a, a VCR or a DVR or that's a, a dashboard cam something. something yeah, dashboard cam. I mean, cam. I mean, just even if it's a, just a tr- minor traffic accident, you can. Uh, you, uh, my car's got seven cameras in it, and yeah. you know, one of those cameras has got a picture of what happened. So then that's digital forensics. You're scared. Me. Seven cameras in your car? I think so. Yeah. Oh, for the love of God. He makes movies. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious if uh, if law enforcement has kind of made that shift to the kind of cloud native, or a lot of what you know, you you might not even need the cell phone in order to gain the actual data that you're after. With all the clouds being live, uploaded, backed up, you know, backup images being able to be acquired remotely at any point from you know a Google account or an iCloud account. Uh, the acquisition of a lot of those, and the, even the SaaS. Um, the SaaS applications that are on your phones that have digital records of where you are, the open source stuff of the telemetry of, you know, latitude, longitude, what hotspots were around you, where you traveled, your maps, given time in an area, all those things are online. So the acquisition, has that begin begin to shift to uh, kind of the cloud native for law enforcement, or are they still trying to catch up to that kind of uh, that mentality? I don't think we're trying to catch up. Uh, it's true that a lot of the stuff is in the cloud, but not all of it is. And we can get more from the physical phone than we can from the cloud many times, specifically how the settings are set in the phone. Uh, many times people, especially the bad guys, are, are, are smart enough to, to turn it off. Uh, so we would, we can do, or a lot of times we'll do a search warrant to the ISP, whoever it might be, get the information from them, and then we'll work from there what we got, and then we can go after the phone after that as well. So, so now, now you need warrants for phones. Uh, prior to 17, you really didn't need warrants. Uh, Riley, California cases. 
cell phones, y if you search a cell phone, you got to get a warrant. There, there's no. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we, I wouldn't. No, and that, that would be no. foolish. I know you, yeah. you wouldn't. That would Can't kill a case. Lose a case for, exactly. Yeah. Unless you're customs and border patrol, and you know, in mm. their jurisdiction, and as you cross the line, whether you're in that case or not, they will look to the phone. Well, the Supreme Court says you can't they because can, there's no yeah. expectation of privacy there. Yeah. Right. Well, so I, I had one more question for you, and I, I know because you were on here, and, I, and I've actually got a hundred other questions I could ask you, obviously, and I'm sure everybody else does too. But we get all night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, what do you, I mean, I know there are police that watch this show and, and what do you think that departments should be doing going forward? I mean, I mean, it's never, I mean, it's always give us more money. I mean, we always have that problem. I mean, I've never, I've never walked into a police department in my life that said, you know what, we got so much cash. We just don't know what to do with ourselves. But what, what should people be doing going forward in terms of some of this digital stuff? Because this is a changing field. It changes constantly. That's why we have a show every week, because there's new stuff all the time. What, what do you think people should be doing uh, you know, in their departments and, and training and things like that to, to actually continue moving ahead? Well, I think you're right. So first and foremost, it's training. And that's not only in the detective division. That's not in the computer crimes unit. That's on the road. So those guys, so many of the, the guys on the road, they're the first ones to come across this stuff. So they need to know what they're looking at and how they can protect it. So if they're going to grab a phone, do they want to be, you know, fingering around to look at different stuff? Maybe, as long as they can document it in some way, if they have to, on scene, okay. But they need to know what evidence they can, they can, they can uh, get. If they're going to a search warrant, do they want to be messing around with a, a desktop or a laptop? Probably not. Uh, they want to maybe take it and maybe do that dead box forensic. Maybe we have to do a live forensic so we have a, one of our analysts that can do it forensically and clean to look at the on scene rather than some, you know, some guy in, in narcotics that's uh, a monkey over there looking <laughs> around, right? So, so uh, and I, I, please, uh, narcotics guys, they're hardworking guys and they're great uh, guys. And yeah. it's, it's a tough business. But my point is that you get someone that's they're trained so to do it. <laughs> they're trained to do it. And I think the important thing is everything changes so often. I mean, we've mm -hmm. I've seen it change from, you know, like I said, dead box to forensics to now we're doing things live on scene. Uh, the phones are everywhere. Sometimes five and six phones. And now when I started off, you had like what maybe two, three gigabytes you'd be looking at. Now you're looking at you know hundreds of thousands of you know yeah. uh, of gigabytes. You know, terabytes, terabytes and fun terabytes. I mean, you know, of of of, of information. And a lot of people don't erase stuff anymore. So they've got everything you can imagine. You can, I mean, I've always said I can learn a lot about a, a person just by looking at their phone or their computer. Well, I used to tell you guys, if you ever came to my house, you were done because uh, uh, we, we moved uh, last year and I, I was literally hauling boxes of hard drives yeah. and old stuff off. I, I, I was, you know, probably hundreds of terabytes of stuff. I don't <laughs> even know what it all was, but it's just like old hard drives we got laying around. <laughs> sure you don't. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> They're all labeled, let me tell you. Yeah. Any other questions for John? You know, it's it's nice, Doug, that you can actually provide the entire tag collection for for Pornhub. <laughs> uh, um, you know, all Full those labels—they they they don't care about the content. They just want, oh, is this how you organize it? This yeah. is awesome. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> right. All right. Well, John, I've got one more thing for you, and sure. we always ask people the first time they're on the show if they'll play five questions with Security Weekly. Are, are you ready to play? I hope so. We'll see. Yeah, you're not. No, just, Probably not. We cleaned these up a few years ago after that. You know, yeah, we, we won't get into that. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, three words to describe yourself. Oh, Jesus. Uh, loyal, uh, happy, and retired. <laughs> uh, those, that, those are good words. I like that. Um, if you were a, this is a great question. For you. If you were a serial killer, what would your weapon of choice be? Hmm. Uh, well, first of all, I think one of my my weapon of choice, my computer. Yes. First of all, would probably my first thing I'd be some, to get to find out who I was going to kill. I guess, but uh, um, he's thought about this. I, I might have. <laughs> I think it's going to be a knife. Okay. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? You won't believe what I just saw. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. What is your favorite hacker movie? My favorite hacker movie. I see, I've never been a real hacker movie guy. It could be almost anything. I've got, uh, I've got, in fact, I've got, we're going to talk about this later. I brought the book. 
the Hacker's Movie Guide book, an actual published book called The Hacker's Movie Guide 2022 23, 2023 edition. On the next segment, we're going we're to talk about oh. some hacker movies too. But uh, yeah. the movie Hackers, remember the movie Hackers? Yeah. Yeah, that was a good one. That's, a, that's, that's, a, yeah, that's a good Someone one. actually wrote a damn book. Yeah, I know. We're I mean, we're going to talk money. about we're going to talk about this thing. It's 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 interesting. I saw I saw an article about this, and I was like, I got to get that for the show. And and uh, but it, it's quite interesting. So yeah, everybody can be thinking about that because we're, we're going to in the next segment we're going to actually ask what is the most obscure hacker movie you can think about. So uh, so you can think about that now. Um, choose two celebrities, alive, dead, fictional, otherwise, <laughs> cartoons to be your parents. <laughs> Wow, celebrities. I'm not a big fan of celebrities either. Yeah, but, they don't uh, have to be celebrities. Uh, they don't have to be. It could be Captain Ahab. It doesn't matter. Uh, well, he's been a big big uh, Clint Eastwood fan. Okay. So Clint and... Uh, uh, who's a hot... Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> she hot. Oh, that's it for us. <laughs> Shut it down. <laughs> uh... I don't He's have a choice for a mother. Punk. Okay, <laughs> he's just going to have Clint. He can fill in all yeah, roles. Clint will it's like Clint yeah. your, Make my day, right? Put that, yeah, on yeah. both sides of that. So <laughs> right. you have familial arguments. going to sure. be ugly. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much, John Alfred, for being here. John, I think John's going to stick around and join us on a panel segment to talk about some other issues. So I hope all of you will stick around as well, and we'll see you in a little bit on the next segment of Security Weekly. Thanks. Okay.